Okay. Uh, looking at our tour of looking at radical Christianity, I did not quite realize that we were going to come to this place. And I can't tell you how excited I am to be here at the Falkenstein Castle. Um, this is recorded both in the Martyr's Mirror and in the, uh, uh, the Hutterian Chronicles. And it's one of the most impressive stories of early Anabaptism. And uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about the scene that brought the brothers here and, and all those sorts of things. Well, we are just across the line, across the river from Moravia. And of course, that's where most of our communities were established mm -hmm. in the 1530s. But uh, there were a few of our communities that were on the Austrian side or in the uh, Weinviertel, which is the, the part of Austria where most of the wine is, uh, okay. is, is produced. Right. And uh, the two of the villages, one we just got crossed through was uh, Drasenhofen and the other one was Steinerbrunn. Okay. And it was in the village of Steinerbrunn, mm -hmm. uh, which... Uh, uh, early on in this uh, story, uh, they were having a, a particular meeting where different groups, different backgrounds were getting together and having a discussion on how they can all work together in peace. And particularly the uh, uh, Philippites were coming yeah, in yeah, yeah, and kind of exactly. join with them there. Many of them were. And Peter yeah. Ritterman was actually out on a mission uh, uh, time and he, uh, and he was away. He was just the, coming back. He was just coming back in the, the process community. of coming back. Right. <laughs> and so while they were all out there, many people were together, then all of a sudden uh, there was a wind of, of who they were and right. where they were right. in, uh, in the village. And all of a sudden the police came from every which direction and they collected a whole bunch of people. I think it's around 190 people. Right, right. And they, they brought them out here into this uh, prison, the prison in the fortress uh, right close by, which is Falkenstein. Yeah. So. And, and, and uh, it says in the Chronicles that when Peter Ritterman got back, he was surprised to find all the men and all the, uh, the, uh, the young men taken. And so it was very shocking to them. Um, when they got here, they mentioned in the Hutterian Chronicles that it was Christmas Day. So they kind of figured, well, we'd have a break on Christmas Day. But sure enough, uh, they brought in a bunch of the inquisitors and they had to go through all these uh, questionings and everything while they were here. Yeah. And uh, we are very thankful that there were many of the young believers that were here were not only just uh, uh, caught into this and drag on this, but they were actually convicted young people mm -hmm. and they were very ready to testify to what they were all about right. and, uh, and steadfastly uh, talked uh, to, the, to the authorities here and not only talked to them, but also wrote things down. Right. And so we have a, a host of uh, letters that were written back to their families and also songs that they wrote together right. and particularly which we call the the song of Falkenstein, the Falkenlieder Lieder, uh, which is in the Hutterite Chronicle yeah, or the Hutterite right. uh, Lieder book, uh, the, the one with all the books, with all the song books together. Okay, okay. And, uh, and this would be one of the, it's a translation of one of them. So you might get one of the, okay. of the names of some of the people that were here. Just a few here and then, uh, and then we'll go on how, what happened when they left yes, here. Yes, what happened okay. when they left because that's incredible too. But so these young men would have written down some of these words back and forth and they've been turned into songs and and everybody put their own name right own at the beginning. It's, it's really incredible piece of literature. Um, Oswald Felger Felger yeah, yeah. said this. Father stand with us so we may freely confess you before the world. The world makes fun of you and asks where is God that we should believe in him. Christoph Ascheberger Ashberger, yeah. Answer, dear father, we will, s will you save me from the fear of those that want to kill me? They come upon me in a rage and dig traps for me, but you are my captain, my shield, and my defense. Jobs from Philach mm -hmm. um, said, arouse yourself, Lord, and remember our plight. The godless think you do not care what happens to us, but lift your hand and save us from eternal pain. Uh, Bastel uh, Beck. Back. Said, but the godless will not listen to what you have said, Lord. They seize your people on the earth and devour them. Have mercy, therefore, on us. Save your little flock and keep us in your, ar in your arms. Blasi uh, Sh Schneider. Schneider said, You will not forsake us, Lord. You hate the scheming of the godless and will overturn what they have planned. Keep us through this hour of great need in your hands. Wolf Schwegel said, do not let our present need frighten us back from you, Lord. Do not let the evil and godless crowd persuade us to sin again. With the hypocrisy of the priest and the threats of the hangman, the Antichrist wants to ensnare us, but save us, Lord, from falling prey to him. Leonhard Roth said, 
Give us the grace, Lord, to carry your cross with willing hearts. Give us your Spirit's love. Do not let us look back, but help us keep your covenant every day, every hour, until the end. Hans Prugel said, Strengthen me in your covenant, Lord. In the deepest desire of my heart, let me wait patiently, quietly on you. Take my weakness and make it your own. Protect me. Kasper Brachmichael. Yeah. And by the way, he was, maybe you can explain a bit. Kasper, he was. Interesting. He was released here or escaped. I, I can't remember, but he was he a He escaped young, down there. He in escaped the, from in the here. Other. And he actually was one of the very first, if not the first, to start the Hatterian Chronicles. Yeah. Wrote as a young man here. He Praise, so young. thanksgiving, and honor to Christ from letting us hear the word of grace. Let us exalt him. Let us bring him our offering in righteousness with great joy. Let us praise him with song. George Creel said, I want to bring my offering to you, Lord, with joy and the power of Jesus Christ. I want to bring it so you may give us your saving grace. Fight for us until we make it through. It goes on and on and on, on, these on. young yeah, men. There's, there's wow, many what a faith. Yeah. It's incredible. There were many uh, personal letters also to their wives, to their mothers. And uh, it, what is interesting is that actually they came from the different groups that they were actually yeah, thinking right, of getting together. Right, right. And they weren't actually fully united yet, but right. they made an agreement while they were here right in this castle that we're in right now, is that uh, since they were in bad strikes here with the enemy, mm -hmm. uh, they will all fight together Amen. in the spirit Amen. of Christ and we will not worry as to which mm -hmm. group or which church or whatever yeah. they're from. They will all work together That's one right. by one. Wow. And that is so much what we still need at this moment in it time. It certainly is. Now, Amen. would you want to tell a bit as to what happened? From here, uh, some of them escaped. Or some of them, they let some of the weaker ones and younger ones. Well, the go. younger ones were actually the they, ones. they okay. didn't take them down there because they thought they were too young to be down at the at the galleys. But the, the rest and of them were too they old. They decided, okay, we're just going to sell them into either slavery to the pirates or particularly to the galley slaves, uh, where they'd be used for battle. Now the young men said, look, we didn't we're, we didn't disobey God on earth. We're certainly not going to do it in the sea, and we're not going to be your galley slaves. We'll die instead of doing that. But so what they did is they chained them up in a chain gang and marched them through, the, the Chronicles mentions all the different cities and villages they went to, all the way to... It would have been through Austria, and once it got into Slovenia, and through that on the other side into what is now the little corner of Italy, right alongside the Adriatic Sea, which is the city of Trieste. Makes me feel pretty shamed as I complain about all the driving we've done on this trip. Yes, to think actually, about all they're watching. as much of the same, same area that we that were coming, been through coming through right through. now. Now, the incredible thing is the guards gave them permission to preach. And, it's, and as they went to village to village, they said, tell the people about your faith. And they went and preached in chains. They were evangelists in chains. That's and exactly. as they went, actually the Chronicles records that many people who heard them in the villages that they preached at actually were converted and came to the Lord and then came back to one of the communities here in Moravia. Uh, it's powerful. Now, those that made it all the way and were put on ships, they were writing all, already that they were not going to compromise. All right, well, that maybe we'll have to put another little detail in, bet in between. They were all together in a prison. In Trieste. Uh, but in Trieste. Uh, but uh, the authorities said, well, it's really not necessary that we put them all in chains or whatever inside the, the prison uh, because they're good people. They won't run away or whatever. They, they wouldn't do the wrong thing. And so they left them in there and they made another promise amongst themselves is that if one is escape they will all escape okay. and otherwise they will all stay together wow. but during the night they were able to take their belts right right okay curiously they were not wearing suspenders they were wearing belts <laughs> okay <laughs> but, uh, whatever they, they all had their their leather belts okay and they, and they tied them together up over the rock wow. and and they were all able to pull out and every one of them was able to get out wow. uh, but then once okay. they were on the other That's side right. they divided them into small groups and they said well it'll be dangerous to have everybody going together uh, so they had little groups here little groups there and they were all okay. they were trying to find their way back over here into Moravia or, or into this area of Austria right. at that point in time now most of them came back okay. uh, but there were some that were recaptured, recaptured. and okay. those were the ones that we really don't know exactly were, what happened they to were them. sent and probably died uh, mm -hmm. or something like that incredible story uh, well, there's a famous picture uh, etching in the martyrs mirror uh, not in our current Herald Press version but in the original and um, it shows a picture of the uh, it's interesting uh, the, the, the drawing we'll see the picture down there of the ladies looking over the wall they show the magistrate crying and weeping because of the emotions that he saw of the community coming here I'm not sure if you can see it on this picture but if you, we're, we're way up high on top of the hill and you see the village is way much lower and the road down to Trieste would have been down into that direction down okay. into the south okay. fascinating and they, uh, they, it says that the Lord of this area actually said he was going to put up a sign 
that said uh, that never was there a people pious or holy in this area like that. And so, although I think either the Martyrs Mirror or the Chronicles mentions he didn't actually put it. You mentioned very nicely when we were down there, there is a sign there today. But now. But now, so <laughs> praise the Lord for that. Well, let's just give thanks to God and, and bless him and ask God to inspire our hearts once again. Let's pray. Oh, God, when I hear these young people boldly proclaiming your truth when they were being caught, boldly proclaiming in the Inquisition that they had the, the questions that were being asked, when I see the verses that they wrote about not losing their faith, God, my heart cries out for my young people. My heart cries out for the whole generation to come, Lord, that we would be able to raise young people that have that kind of a conviction, that kind of dedication to serve God with all their heart. Dear Lord, I pray that you would once again raise up a generation of young people that would be able to understand the faith of Jesus Christ like that with no compromise. Given all the different temptations, all the different things that they were facing, oh God, I pray you do it again. Amen. And dear God, as we think of what happened here, of the example, you think we think of the preaching and the and the and the, what they had. Lord, it makes our life of all of our goals of just trying to live a nice life. It seems so vain. Oh God, give within us a passion and a vision to serve you and to plant your kingdom, to preach your gospel, just like they did who traveled from this area. Oh God, I pray that you would bring down the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness in this European area, this Asian area, and that you would once again put your spirit here and raise up faithful believers that would glorify your name. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray you would do it again, Lord. Do it again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 From volume one, page 187, the story starts uh, as several of the ministers were coming back from active time in, in mission work. Uh, beginning in the middle of page 187, the story starts here. Um, when Leonard Langestil had visited as many God-fearing people as possible in Tyrol, he had worked hard to gather the saints for the Lord. He returned joyfully in the fall to the church community. He brought with him many who had surrendered their lives to God. But Leonard's wife, Apollyanna, was arrested and taken to Brixen because she held steadfastly to the faith in Christ and refused to recant. She was drowned. And then it goes on uh, right from there into the story. A little later, around November the 11th, Christoph Gaschel and his companions returned from Carthenia and Styria to God's church community. In the week after St. Nicholas Day, that's December 6, Peter Riddemann returned from Hesse to Steinenbrunn in Austria, not knowing that the provost had carried off the brothers. He found, as he came back into the community, he found only sisters and children. There was heartbreak and great grief. Hans Gintner also came back from Württemberg into an overwhelming distress in God's church community. Then it continues on. The beginning of this time of tribulation is described in what follows. And here the writer is explaining this whole time period. When God wished to increase His glory and the welfare of the believers, He put those who had joined together in His name to a rigorous trial, as gold is tried in the fire. This was to test what was in their hearts, so that the steadfastness of their faith would be visible in them as God's children. At the same time, the malice of the old serpent showed up in the false prophets who beset the Roman king Ferdinand in the same way that Satan beset Job, filling his ears with unjust accusations against the church of God. They goaded him on until he finally did as they wanted and dispatched his marshal from Vienna with the provost and some mounted attendants who arrived without warning at Falkenstein. Taking a reckless mob with them, they attacked the Christian community 
at Steinenbrunn in the late evening of December 6, 1539. They locked all of the men they could find in one room, the women and girls in another. They posted guards and made a terrifying uproar, plundering whatever they could. Most of all, they wanted to capture the elders and servants of the church, hoping to get large sums of money and goods from them, thus robbing the poor without a thought that God would require it with heavy punishment. Although the people they were after were in the house, God in His providence saved those brothers from the wanton rabble. Unwilling to leave even a little food for widows and orphans, they searched every corner but could find nothing. For God frustrated all their plans and turned their efforts into sheer folly. During this infamous raid, the sick, the children, and the expectant mothers were overwhelmed with terror and fear for their lives. The brothers and sisters who were locked up prepared themselves to sacrifice their lives for God and die by fire or the sword. Meanwhile, King Ferdinand dispatched his marshal, several scholars and priests, as well as the executioners as their, quote, high priest and assistants. They used Christmas Day, a thing rarely done anywhere, to begin their malice treatment of the captive witnesses for the truth. Some they questioned under torture regarding their basic beliefs and hopes and where they kept their treasures. The believers confess unanimously that Christ the Savior was their only hope and dearest treasure, and whom they had attained the Father's mercy. Their tormentors question them about many other points with the intention of teaching and converting them. After hearing this and many other statements of faith, the royal emissaries returned to Vienna, and the brothers remained in prison in Falkenstein's castle. In 1540, the royal marshal came to Falkenstein, accompanied by a mounted attendant known as Long Hans, or Tall Hans, and the provost and other armed riders. They questioned the imprisoned brothers one by one. All who refused to agree with them and held firm to the truth were bound in pairs with iron fetters, their hands chained together. When word got around that the prisoners were to be sent to the sea, Many sisters in the faith came to Falkenstein Castle. Some of them were wives of the brothers, others were friends and relatives. They knelt down together and prayed fervently to their Father, the Most High God, for protection from all sin and evil on land or sea, and for steadfast hearts to remain faithful to the truth until death. After they had prayed, the marshal's attendant, Long Hans, gave orders for everyone to make ready for departure. They took leave with many bitter tears, encouraging one another to hold firm to the Lord and to the truth. Each one commended the other to God's merciful protection, not knowing if any would ever see the other again on this earth. Let each one judge for himself what a hard struggle that was for husbands to be parted from their wives and for fathers to leave their little children behind. In truth, Flesh and blood cannot do it, but God will seek out those who cause such great distress and punish them severely. The leave-taking was such a pitiful sight that the royal marshal and some of the men were unable to hold back their tears. When things were ready and the escort had arrived, the believers were marched through the gates two by two, firmly trusting God would protect them. Ninety set out after being imprisoned for six and a half weeks. The sisters had to stay behind in the castle. They climbed on the walls and, heartbroken with grief, gazed after their brothers, to whom they were bound by divine love, until they could see them no longer. Then they were sent away from the castle to return home. Those brothers who were not taken to the sea because they were weak or sick or too young were held in the castle. Several of the young boys were given into the possession of Austrian noblemen, but nearly all of them returned to the church. The other brothers remained in Falkenstein Castle until God in His mercy led them out. On one occasion, the Lord vowed He would place an inscription above the castle gate, stating that since it was built, there had never been so many devout people in it as at this time, but it was likely that He forgot to do this. In spite of Himself, He had had to witness to the truth. The great distress came upon the faithful because they testified against popes 
and priest against their sinful lives and the whole idolatrous system, saying that God will punish them severely for their abominations and let them die in their sins. That is why King Ferdinand had empowered the bloodthirsty mob of priests to do as they pleased with the prisoners. The priests were quick in deciding that the brothers deserved to die, that they could not be tolerated on land, but should be sent to sea to waste away in great suffering as galley slaves. They were to be handed over to the High Admiral, Andrea Doria, for use in his fleet of warships that fought the Turks and other enemies. Even as the brothers were being violently carried off and imprisoned, they warned the king's agents that they would not row a stroke to aid war and pillage, whether on land or at sea. They refused to take part in evil and to sin against God because their hearts rejected all sin. God in His invincible power would protect them at sea as on the land and keep them in His grace. Nevertheless, the king's men received strict instructions that the prisoners be marched under guard from one courthouse to the next. So these witnesses to the truth were brought before the magistrates in towns and villages, where they had to suffer much hostility and hardship. But God always gave means of grace to His people. The brothers were able to pray to God every morning and evening without anyone stopping them. Any brother who was given words of solace or encouragement from God could speak without fear and so bring comfort to his brothers. The believers were deeply grateful for this special gift and mercy of God. This, among other things, worked a change in people's attitude towards them in many places, with the result that they were regarded with sympathy instead of being taken for criminals as when they first arrived. As well as that, the soldiers who accompanied them frequently spoke on their behalf and encouraged them to witness to their faith in song and other ways instead of passing through the towns in silence. In this manner, the band of believers was driven like a flock of sheep through town and countryside to the sea at Tresti, first from Falkenstein Castle to Vienna, then to Neustadt, Schottwein, and other the, uh, the different places all through Europe all the way down to Tristi. All, all this time, the brothers endured hunger and great hardship. They were fed with the bread of fear and the waters of distress. That was the way God chose to reveal His truth to peoples who were still in ignorance. To be heard like the sound of a mighty trumpet, God has always provided means of grace to draw men away from evil, as in this case. When the believers passed through the different places where strange languages were spoken and people had never heard the truth, they found some in southern Aust Austria, uh, Carinola, and northern Italy who were moved by their witnesses to seek it. A number of people embraced the truth and are serving God with sincere hearts to this day. As for the ill treatment the prisoners received in many places, how they were beaten and roughly handled, how they were tied to one another with ropes and chains, all this is unnecessary to describe. Everyone can imagine that what goes on in such place is far from pleasant. But although it was a dreadful experience, God always comforted the brothers in their hearts. Even in times of greatest distress, God does not forget His own. He gave several of the prisoners inner promptings of hope and trust that God would show them a way to escape. They spoke of this together in the fear of God. And although they were determined to suffer and die for the truth rather than to take part in wicked piracy, they had every reason to continue sighing and pleading that God might demonstrate His honor in them. As they prayed, God showed them that they should agree among themselves how the strong were to take care of the weak and how one would help the other. Even though they had little food, they trusted that the Lord would provide for them so that they need not beg or search for bread. On the twelfth night in Tristi, they all got free of their bonds. They walked out of the prison, and God showed them the place where within an hour they could all let themselves down from the city walls with ropes. The ropes that had bound them and by which they had been led in the prison now served for their escape. So whatever evil design ungodly men have on the devout, God turns to good for His own people. 
Thanks to God's intervention, they escaped from their enemies. With all the diligent watches the ungodly had posted on the city walls, God turned their persecution to folly. He showed the brothers a place right next to the sentry box on the wall. When all of them, sick and healthy, were over the wall, they knelt down to praise and thank Him. The Lord also prepared the way for most of them to return to the church, the saints in Moravia, their hearts filled with joy and peace. Twelve of them, however, were seized in the merciless pursuit that followed. They were handed over to Andrea Doria, the emperor's admiral for naval warfare, and taken to the galleys with the intention of using them at the oars. But the faithful were determined to risk their lives to be flogged rather than to set their hands to rowing. We do not yet know exactly how each one met his end, but if they remained faithful to the Lord, it is certain that they did not have many good days left. The brothers whom God had delivered returned to the church in Moravia on the fourth Sunday of Lent in 1540. They were welcomed with great joy and thanksgiving as a gift from God. God of our fathers, whose